Well, good morning. We obviously are facing a very different time and we're going to try and, and uh, answer some questions for you, particularly around procedures being done at the Cleveland Clinic. And we know many of you want to access our care. So together with me today is uh, Samia Kapadia, our Chairman of Department of Cardiovascular Medicine, and also Mark Gilinov, our Chairman of Cardiothoracic Surgery, and we'll try and answer some of your questions. As a broad introduction, uh, obviously the new virus, uh, coronavirus, that is affecting uh, so many people in the world has come as a big shock to everybody. However, this is not entirely new virus. The coronavirus has been around for a long time. And for example, the so-called MERS, the Middle Eastern episode oh, that uh, uh, was associated with camels, uh, had a much higher risk uh, with uh, death as far as when it spread. And then the SARS virus, which is another virus that ran uh, many years ago, that was also a coronavirus. So the coronavirus is different from the influenza viruses, but from the point of view of likely progression, think of it as another type of influenza flu virus. My own proje pro projections are that the, this is going to be around for about three to four months. The peak is very dependent on our rate of admission of patients to hospital and the degree of isolation. So just give you an idea, if the isolation is not carried out, then we expect the peak to occur earlier and that would probably now be in mid-May. If we have a 20% reduction in interaction uh, between people, in other words, isolation has some effect, then the peak will probably be mid-June. If we have a very effective isolation and a 40% reduction of interaction of people, the peak will probably be in mid-August. Now this is the peak. There'll be lingering rates of infection and on top of that, it's unclear how long things will last. Now, a big question is the degree of isolation and how long it's carried out. We know from the flu epidemic in 1918, the so-called Spanish flu that lasted three years, that there were three waves. With this epidemic or pandemic now as, as it's called, it appears that things are happening more quickly. So, for example, China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, South Korea are already expecting or have experienced second waves of infection. So those are things that play into this. A couple of things about this virus that may be of interest to you. It gains in entry into cells to a receptor called the ACE2 receptor. So these little spikes on the coronavirus, the sort of spikes you see in the pictures, they're like little fists. They attach to these receptors. Now these receptors are very common in the lungs, obviously, but also in the heart and other organs to a less extent. And that's why uh, they uh, particularly affect the lungs, but also can affect the heart in about 7.5% of patients. We also know from what we've seen in China, South Korea, and Washington, that patients with cardiovascular disease, and this is mainly coronary artery disease, are more prone to the infection and complications related to it. And obviously, people who have lung disease, smokers, vaping, that seems to be also predisposing people to infections. We also know that our own experience here at the Cleveland Clinic, we have uh, about 30 patients now. That about half the patients need to be in ICU and be on a ventilator related to the respiratory complications. However, from our experience so far, uh, we have only had one patient that has had more extensive support with uh, heart-lung machines. So that is less uh, often but we have prepared for that and if 
we flatten the curve, and you've by now heard of the curve, then we'll be able to manage that from a cardiovascular point of view. So there were a number of questions that uh, we had. I'll answer some and then I'll pass on to Samir and then also to Mark to answer them. So one question that comes up is so-called elective surgery. So we worked with the governor here in Ohio and the decision was made that it would be defined as essential versus non-essential. So we here at the Cleveland Clinic have looked over all our patients that we were due to see and tried to sort patients into essential versus non-essential. Now for essential patients, those are patients that who uh, potentially would suffer organ damage or are having symptoms, having pain, or where there's risk to life if the patients do not get treated, and we define that as the next eight weeks. So we have postponed some operations, but not all, but if people are having symptoms, then we've recommended that patients undergo surgery uh, during this time because there's obviously some risk if patients do not uh, get treated. So another question then has become, uh, how do you contact us? Now we've been working a lot with virtual visits. Those can be done via computers and uh, potentially FaceTime or telephone. Most of our contact has been occurring by telephone and you're welcome to phone our numbers and our nurse managers will help uh, triaging uh, your situation and uh, at the same time our physicians will be involved uh, with helping on that. Another question that's come up is how safe is it to come into the Cleveland Clinic? And what uh, has happened is everybody who works at the Cleveland Clinic every morning, as they come into work, they get tested for their temperature. So we have a thermal scan and to check everybody is first of all a Cleveland Clinic employee and secondly that uh, they are safe to interact with patients. Let me remind you that our procedures also people wear gowns and face masks and hats and so from the point of view of spread of infections to patients um, that is in very low risk. We've also limited visitors to only essential periods of visitation and Mark can explain fully uh, what that involves. Another uh, thing that has happened as far as reducing the risk of transmission is that uh, we have banned all travel by our uh, physicians and staff, uh, both on a national basis and an international basis, and that's been in place now for a number of uh, weeks. When it comes to visiting uh, patients, there are some restrictions, but we also are flexible when it comes to that uh, issue. So with that, um, I'm going to hand over to Samir to answer some of the questions. One of the ones is uh, the so-called ARB drugs like Losartan, some of the other drugs, and also uh, non-steroidal drugs. And I'll ask Samir to uh, answer some of those questions. Basically at this time, it's unclear uh, but we are actively enrol enrolling patients in study currently to look at this, but uh, I'll ask Samir to answer some of the questions. Thank you, Dr. Swenson. I just want to first of all tell everybody that uh, the risk of getting or contacting uh, the virus is quite similar for all the patients. How sick you will get after contacting the virus depends on your comorbidities. So if you can prevent contact, if you can have good distance from the people, wash your hands and take all the precautions, it is not that if you have a heart problem, you are likely to contact the virus more compared to people who do not have heart disease. So this is an important message. This will give you a little bit more uh, safety uh, in your mind at least to think that you are not at a high risk of contacting the virus. On the other hand, if you do contact the virus, if you have heart problems 
especially coronary artery disease, as Dr. Svensson mentioned, or if you have heart failure, then obviously your risk of having long-term complications or serious complications uh, from the illness is increased. Therefore, it is even more important to prevent social contact, social distancing, and keep the social distancing and uh, prevent the disease uh, from happening. With that said, should we have differences in medications, if you are taking ACE inhibitors or ARB medications, there is some data to say that the ACE2 inhibitor is upregulated. Is it true that you should stop taking the medication? No. The Heart Failure Society has very clearly mentioned that you should not stop these medications because the harm that you can get from stopping the medication is much more than potential benefit that you may have. You must contact your cardiologist if you have any questions. In Cleveland Clinic, we are doing virtual visits for everybody. So if anybody has a question, even if a new patient or an old patient, we are able to see them as a virtual visit. Right now, even if you are in a different state than Ohio, you can still call us and we can still see you and provide care, even pres prescribe medications uh, as a virtual visit. It will require a face-to-face -face discussion with some form of video conferencing. But with that, we can provide right now a good care to all the patients and answer all your questions regarding all these different, different things that uh, come to people's mind. The second thing is that essential procedures in cardiovascular medicine, including angioplasties, including valve replacements, uh, pacemakers, uh, devices, are many. What we say since, as you heard from Dr. Svensson, that this peak may happen from June to even August, uh, what we are telling people is that if we cannot delay the procedure to prevent the end organ damage, meaning the heart problems or lung problems, or we cannot prevent from people from having uh, symptoms, ongoing symptoms, then we should consider them essential if we can wait more than less than eight weeks. So eight weeks is the term that we are using in our mindset to decide whether this is considered essential or non-essential. Uh, we are currently doing more than 50% of our procedures or roughly 50% of our procedures. We are taking extreme care for all the patients uh, to make sure that they don't contact the virus while they are in the hospital. So we are doing everything possible from the healthcare workers to the visitors to the ancillary services uh, to make sure that it is as safe and as, uh, as convenient to the patient as possible because safety and to some extent convenience uh, are a little bit uh, at contradiction because we cannot have all the patients visit uh, their families at all the times, but we have specific uh, rules and we, we accommodate patients uh, according to their needs. And finally, I want to say that all the healthcare workers in Cleveland Clinic are incredibly dedicated uh, to what they do. Everybody is working together uh, in these difficult times, including from the ICU to the inpatient care, to the virtual visits, to the outpatient care. Uh, working with different colleagues in different institutions. So we are actually very proud uh, in this difficult time to provide incredible care for your heart problems. And uh, feel free to reach out to us anytime and we'll try to make, uh, try to accommodate your needs uh, to the best of our abilities. We're still doing a fair bit of cardiac surgery because as Dr. Kapadia said, we split procedures or operations into two categories, essential or non-essential. And cardiac surgery is very often essential, meaning it's life-saving and reduces symptoms. And in many, many cases, we can't safely delay an operation, a cardiac surgical operation for two months. So we do operate and we operate safely. We are fully staffed to perform these operations. Patients ask, if I have my surgery now, will I be at more risk for getting the virus in the hospital? And our answer is no, because as Dr. Kapadia said, we're screening all of us, the healthcare workers, limiting visitation. So the hospital is actually a very safe place to be in terms of the virus and contagion at this time. We've been asked by patients who had their heart surgery previously, 
am I now at increased risk? And you are at no more increased risk of contracting the virus, but if you do get the virus and you have heart disease, you are at increased risk for complications. That said, if you have had a valve repair procedure, for example, mitral valve repair, and you have normal heart function, you don't have any problems, no arrhythmias, no heart failure, you're likely at no greater risk than the general population, meaning you're fine, but maintain your social distancing, personal hygiene, washing your hands, don't shake hands, etc. Well, thank you for watching this uh, brief summary of our understanding of things. Uh, keep watching what uh, is broadcast from the White House, from your governors, and uh, keep in contact with your cardiologists. So thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, please uh, reach out to us um, on our website. There are uh, phone numbers to connect with us and uh, keep safe. Keep uh, your social distance and use lots of hand sanitizer and um, don't cough on anybody. Use uh, the usual etiquette for coughing. Thank you very much.